Well, good morning and greetings uh, to all of you. I bring you greetings from Pastor John MacArthur and the elders of, of Grace Community Church. Uh, it's, a, it's a delight to be with you, uh, always a delight to be in, back in New Jersey and obviously seeing family and celebrating Christmas and New Year's and all these things, but uh, it, it is a wonderful privilege to be with you and minister the Word of God uh, to you. I, I thank God for this church. I thank God for the, the pulpit and the, and the Word that is expounded from it. Uh, speaking about uh, Calvary to someone uh, in the last several weeks and was just saying that when, when you have a church that knows the gospel, knows what preaching is, and is eager to hear the word preached, whatever it has to say, you have a blessed congregation. And, uh, and you have that. You are that. And we, we thank God uh, for you. And uh, as Pastor Joe said, uh, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians, actually chapter 5 this morning. So if you haven't already, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, it's, it's New Year's, right? It's, it's the end of t- 2018 and the beginning of 2019. And as we come upon this new year, a season of new beginnings, uh, I want to preach about the new birth. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 16 and 17 is our text this morning. I'll read that a little bit later. But I want to begin by asking you, what makes someone a Christian? There's a lot of confusion over that, the answer to that question, even within the church. What makes someone a Christian? At the most fundamental level, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Now, many people would say that what makes someone a Christian is family tradition or heredity. You know, they were born into a Christian family, similar to how a, an Irish person is born uh, Irish. Those whose parents and grandparents were Christians are born Christian. Others would say that it's good manners and politeness and a pleasant attitude that makes somebody a Christian. Someone who says please and thank you. Someone who says yes sir and no ma'am. Someone who looks you in the eye when they talk to you. That's what, what it means to be a Christian. Others would say that being a Christian means you fight for the betterment of society. Christians fight poverty. They feed the hungry. They devote themselves to working for social justice. Still others identify Christianity with a political party. So if you're for limited government and economic conservatism, and if you're against abortion and homosexual marriage, well, then you're a Christian. Some people are a little bit more religious in their definition of a Christian. They might say that being a Christian is living a changed life. It's the reformation of our morals. A Christian, they'd say, is someone who doesn't cheat on their spouse or cheat on their taxes. Someone who doesn't abuse alcohol or drugs or someone who doesn't use foul language. Other people would say that the fulfillment of religious duties makes a Christian. You're a Christian if you read your Bible pray, sing worship songs, and attend church. Others say it's a matter of fearing God's judgment and believing that Jesus died on the cross to save us from hell. Still others would say it's feeling bad about your sin that makes you a Christian. Everybody sins, but the ones who feel guilty and and know what they're doing is wrong, well, those are the true Christians. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that none of those things makes a person a Christian. Not a one. Now, it's true that Christians mourn over their sin. It's true that Christians read Scripture and pray and are members of a local church. It's true that Christians are faithful to their spouses and don't give themselves to drunkenness and they discipline their tongues. But not a one of those things makes them a Christian. Christianity is not so natural a religion that you can be a Christian if you clean up your life and your language, parrot out a few memorized phrases, and show up to church once a week. Man's problem is that isn't that our thinking or our speech or our behavior or our politics just need to be refined a little bit here and there. No, something is so fundamentally wrong with us that Jesus says in John chapter 3 that if we are to have any hope of seeing the kingdom of God, we must be born all over again. The call of the gospel is not behavior modification. Sin has so 
infected and corrupted mankind that nothing less than the wholesale renovation of the soul is required for salvation. As Charles Spurgeon aptly observed, he says, The Scriptures do not say ye must be improved, but ye must be born again. What makes a man a Christian? What truly distinguishes a genuine believer in Jesus from those who are unsaved is regeneration. Regeneration. The spiritual recreation of one dead in sin. The divine impartation of spiritual life into the soul of a sinner. God speaks of the reality of regeneration in the new covenant promise of Ezekiel 36, 26, when he says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. What makes someone a Christian is the spiritual heart surgery performed by Almighty God, wherein He removes your sinful heart of stone and totally transforms you from the inside out so that your thinking and your desires and your tastes and your affections and your wills are entirely renewed. Your spiritual eyes, once blind to the glory of Christ, have now been opened to behold the ugliness of sin and the beauty of holiness as it's comprehended in Jesus. The sin that once tasted so sweet now brings nothing but bitterness. The sin that was so alluring and enticing and satisfying now has no pull on your affections. It's lost on you. And the righteousness and the virtue that you once had no taste for is now what you hunger and thirst after. See, the Christian is the one who has been regenerated, has been made an entirely new creation from the inside out. And in our text this morning, the Apostle Paul has something to teach us about the Christian's experience of regeneration. And his comments come in a section of his letter that really begins in chapter 5, verse 11, where he's begun speaking about two driving motivations in his life that fuel and empower him for radically sacrificial ministry. The first uh, motivation is in verses 11 to 13. It's the fear of God. He, He lived his entire life in light of the fact that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of our every thought, every word, and every deed. Paul says he conducted every aspect of his ministry in full knowledge that every word on his lips and every intention of his heart lay open to the searching, omniscient gaze of the Lord Jesus. And that drove him to live and to minister with the utmost integrity so that no matter what the false apostles in Corinth were accusing him of, his conscience was clear before the Lord. And then the second driving motivation in his life is the love of Christ. He says in verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. See, Paul is compellingly motivated. He is absolutely driven by Christ's love for his people as displayed in the gospel. And then meditating on that love, Paul goes on to describe key components of the gospel, the gospel that so brilliantly displays the love of Christ for his people. He speaks about the doctrine of substitution, the doctrine, verse 14, that one died for all, that the one man, Christ, died on behalf of or in the place of his people as our substitute, as the one who extinguishes the righteous wrath of the Father against our sin by suffering that punishment in our our place. He speaks of the doctrine of solidarity or uh, of representative headship. Paul says, one died for all, therefore all died. That is to say that there exists such a union between Christ, the head, and His people, the body, that when He died to sin on the cross, so also did His people die to sin. And when He rose again to newness of life, so also did His people rise again to newness of life in Him. And then he speaks of the doctrine of sanctification, substitution, solidarity, and sanctification in verse 15. 
That he says the very purpose of God's saving grace by which we're justified in Christ is that we might display His glory by living a life of practical righteousness in obedience to Him. He says that they who live may no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. And as Paul then continues meditating on the glorious theological truths of the gospel by which the love of Christ is displayed, he then turns to speak about the doctrine of regeneration. The sanctification that he speaks about in verse 15 of no longer living unto ourselves but unto Christ is the result of this radical inward transformation of regeneration, which he addresses in verses 16 and 17. And that'll be our text. Follow along with me in your Bibles as I read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes, Therefore... From now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. And even, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. When you become united to Christ by faith, one of the results of that union Verse 16a is the way you view other people is entirely transformed. Because, verse 16b, the way you view Christ has been transformed. And your view of Christ is transformed because you yourself have been transformed. Because regeneration transforms the entirety of who you are. And because, in my mind, it's easier to reason from cause to effect then from effect back to cause, I'm going to treat verse 17 first, where Paul describes regeneration, and then verse 16 after it, where he outlines two results of regeneration. So that'll make a three-point outline. We'll consider first, that the Christian is a new creation. Second, that he has a new view of Christ. And third, that he has a new view of others. First, in his view of his, in view of his union to Christ, the Christian is said to be, number one, a new creation. Verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Notice, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has become united to Jesus Christ by saving faith in the gospel, if anyone has died to sin and, sin and self in union to, with the one who died to sin once for all, he is a new creation. There are no exceptions. This is definitional. There is no such thing as an unregenerate Christian. There is no such thing as being united to Christ in salvation without having been totally transformed from the inside out by the work of the Holy Spirit. The definitive, distinguishing mark of every true believer in Jesus is that he is regenerate, that he has been born again, that he is a new creation. And we need to be a new creation in Christ. As we said before, something was so fundamentally wrong with us that we needed to be recreated. The Apostle John records Jesus' words that we need to be born all over again. Paul puts it plainly in Titus chapter 3. He says in Titus 3.3, 3, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. This is the natural man's miserable condition. How are we going to get out of it? To clean up our act? To modify our behavior, to reform our morals? No. Man, by his nature, is so hopelessly corrupted by sin that he must look entirely outside of himself for salvation. And that's precisely Paul's answer in Titus 3, 4, the next verse. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
Paul says something very similar in Ephesians chapter 2 as he reminds the church of Ephesus who they were before salvation. He says in Ephesians 2, 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Not injured, not sick, dead. Though we possess physical life from the very moment of our conception, from that very same moment, because of our union with Adam, we are utterly devoid of any spiritual life. We are spiritual corpses, and we come out that way. He goes on in Ephesians 2, 3, We all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. This is what we are by nature. Nothing at all has to happen to us to make us this way. By nature, we are children of wrath. We are born in such a way that if nothing and no one were to intervene, we would be just recipients of the wrath of God against our sin. This is who we are. And so once again, I ask, what is the remedy for such a hopeless condition? A laundry list of religious duties by which we seek to earn the favor of God? It's impossible. What duties can a dead man perform? How can someone dead in trespasses and sins raise himself to life? He can't. The one thing we need most is entirely outside of our power to perform. And that's why Paul goes on to say in the next verse, Ephesians 2, 4, but God, not but us, so we did, therefore we undertook, but God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You see, sin has so infected the totality of our being, our minds, our hearts, our wills, all of us, that we come into this world spiritually dead, all our faculties corrupted by sin. We're spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that the, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. We're spiritually deaf. Jeremiah 6.10 says that our ears are uncircumcised and that we cannot listen. Jesus said in John 8.47, you cannot hear my word. Not only are we blind and deaf, but our will and our affections are disordered and enslaved to sin. Jeremiah 17.9 says that the heart is deceitful above all else and is incurable. We've already seen from Ezekiel 36 that Scripture says the natural man's heart is a heart of stone. It's cold. It's unresponsive to any meaning and glory of divine truth. Sin has so pervaded our nature as to leave no part of us untouched by its corruption. We need to be born again. We need to be regenerated and renewed. We need to be made alive. And in Christ, we find God's grace perfectly suited to our need. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. In chapter 4, verse 6 of 2 Corinthians, Paul likens this work of new creation to God's work of the original creation. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Just as in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And by the creative power of his word, the galaxies leapt into existence. In regeneration, God sovereignly speaks into the darkened and dead heart. Let there be light. And instantaneously, he births the light of the, the knowledge of the glory of Christ. Spiritual life where it had not existed. He cures spiritual blindness. He opens the ears of the deaf with this sovereign call to life. He removes the heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. He renews the affections so that the new man hates sin and loves righteousness. See, just as depravity was total, just as no part of our nature escaped the corruption of sin, so also is regeneration 
total. No part of our nature escapes the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to notice precisely how Paul talks about regeneration in this verse. The phrase that the NAS translates, he's a new creature, is a smoothing out of the original. If you have the New American Standard, you'll notice the words, he is, in italics, indicating that they weren't in the original language. So literally, the Greek reads like this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. It's an exuberant interjection like Paul could barely contain himself as he wrote. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. And in using that phrase, it's unmistakable that Paul wants to draw an inseparable connection between the regeneration of sinful individuals and the coming renewal of the entire creation. In fact, if it wasn't for the very individualizing language at the beginning of the verse, if anyone is in Christ, it would have been very natural to hear Paul's reference to the new creation as a reference to the new heavens and the new earth. And those two concepts aren't unrelated in Scripture. In fact, while the concept is spread throughout the New Testament, the Greek word for regeneration is only used in two verses. One is Titus 3.5, which we've read already. The other is in Matthew 19.28, where Jesus speaks about the time of His second coming as the regeneration. And further still, Romans 8 explicitly ties the regeneration of the creation to the regeneration of mankind. Romans 8.19 says, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. So the sin-cursed creation is waiting eagerly for the time when the children of God will be revealed to be what Christ has redeemed them to be. Then he says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So just as the curse of creation was intimately bound up with the curse of man, right? The creation was cursed when man sinned. So also is the redemption of creation inextricably tied to the redemption of man. The creation will be freed from the curse of sin when man is freed from the curse of sin. Now, the implications of that are astounding because what is happening in the renewal and recreation and regeneration of a sinner when he comes to Christ is nothing less than the prefiguring and inbreaking of that final renewal and recreation and regeneration of the entire cosmos. You see, Christ didn't come only to save our souls. He came to save the entire creation. And so there is coming a day when Christ will return and this entire world will be purged from the, its sin and evil through the judgment of fire and will be recreated into this most blessed paradise in order to be a suitable habitation for the redeemed children of God. Revelation 21 says there's coming a time when the present heaven and earth will pass away. When a time when every wrong will be made right, when every ounce of evil will be eradicated, when every tear will be wiped from the eyes of God's children, where, the, where there will be no more death, where there will be no more mourning, where there will be no more pain. And as Scripture speaks of that time, it tells us what God is going to say on that day. Revelation 21.5, Behold, I am making all things new. What does Paul say in our very verse? If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Behold, new things. Behold, all things have become new. So do you see? Salvation by grace through faith in Christ, regeneration by the Holy Spirit is nothing less than a microcosm of the redemption of the entire cosmos. Nothing less than the glory of the new heavens and the new earth breaking into this present evil age in the reborn soul of the believer in Jesus. How great a salvation with which we have been saved. And just as there is an unspeakable difference between this creation and the next, so also is there an unspeakable difference between the unregenerate sinner and the one who has been recreated in the likeness of Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things 
have come. All of our blindness, all of our deafness, all of our deadness, all of our uncleanness has been nailed to the cross. Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And so, dear Christian, I ask you, was your life before Christ one of great shame? Was it one of gross immorality? Was it of one of uncommon wickedness? Was there fornication and adultery? Was there drug use and imprisonment? Was there sexual perversion? I tell you, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. You have been transformed from the inside out. You have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ and are being progressively transformed and conformed into His image. You can, therefore, cut all ties with the past and live in the freedom of the new creation. And if you're outside of Christ this morning, if you're laboring under the burden of sins such as those, I just invite you to run to Christ who opens His arms and says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Turn from your sins and lay them at the cross of Christ. Trust in Him for forgiveness and for righteousness because it is only by saving faith in Him, if any man is in Christ, that anyone is made a new creation. Well, those glorious truths provide just a glimpse into what regeneration is. It is to become an entirely new creation. As we move to our second point, working backwards from verse 17 into verse 16, now we want to consider what regeneration results in. And we see two results that Paul focuses on in verse 16. The first of which is that becoming a new creation necessarily leads to a new view of Christ. To a new view of Christ. Let's read verse 16 and focus especially on the second half of the verse. Paul writes, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him in this way no longer. So what does Paul mean when he says, we have known Christ according to the flesh? He means that he once regarded Christ from a fleshly point of view, according to worldly standards paying special attention to the way that things looked outwardly and externally rather than internally and spiritually. There was a time in Paul's life when he judged Christ in accordance with the standards and values that derive from living life, on, uh, living life as if physical life in this world is all that exists. There was a time when he looked upon Jesus as a poor, uneducated vagrant, the illegitimate son of a carpenter from the no-name city of Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? In Galilee of the Gentiles. He saw him as a self-appointed pseudo-rabbi who was an anti-law, anti-Moses, insurrectionist, and messianic imposter. Paul saw Jesus as a weak, suffering criminal, as a heretic, a crucified heretic, who died deservingly under the curse of God whose followers were delusional fanatics that needed to be systematically imprisoned and executed. Yes, Paul had known Christ after the flesh. He regarded Him and judged Him in a fleshly manner. Yet now, he says, we know Him in this way no longer. Paul's own experience of regeneration caused him to come to an entirely new view of Christ. When God shone the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ into Paul's heart, he also shone a light from heaven into his eyes that knocked him to the ground on the Damascus road. And though Paul's physical eyes were blinded for the next three days, his spiritual eyes were opened for the very first time. The scales that would fall from his physical eyes just a few days later had fallen from his spiritual eyes when he saw the risen Christ. And in that moment, when the Lord God gave Paul eyes to see and ears to hear and removed his heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh, the first thing that changed about Paul was his evaluation of who Jesus was. Now he saw. Though he knew Christ according to the flesh at the start of that day, now he knew, them, he knew him in that way no longer. In the blazing light of heavenly glory, Paul saw that Jesus, the Jesus he'd been persecuting, 
was the long-awaited Messiah. He was the Holy One of God. He was the coming one, the Savior of Israel. He was not a crucified criminal. He was the resurrected Lord of all creation. He was not the illegitimate son of a carpenter. He was the son of the living God. He was crushed under the weight of God's wrath, but not for his own sins, but as the substitute and great high priest for all those who would believe in him. He was the supremely glorious, surpassingly valuable Savior for whom Paul would eventually suffer the loss of all things and count them but refuse so that he might gain this priceless treasure who is Jesus Christ. This is the first result of regeneration. When Almighty God issues His sovereign decree for light to shine forth into the heart that is dead in sin, when the eyes are opened and the ears are unstopped, When the heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh, the first thing that changes is the sinner's view of Jesus. The natural man regards Jesus according to the flesh. He's just a puritanical killjoy who threatens to punish you if you don't do everything he says. Or he's a man who was deified by his followers. He's a character in a story who was made up as a psychological crutch so that weak people could get through the day. Or he's just boring. And uninteresting. Whatever claims he makes about himself, just yawn. I don't care. And you know, it doesn't even have to be negative. You can have an altogether positive evaluation of Christ and have it be nevertheless a fleshly evaluation. So many today conceive of Jesus as a great moral teacher, uh, an exemplary philosopher, an inspired prophet, a nonviolent revolutionary political protester worthy of imitation. Or just a good example of how we ought to sacrifice ourselves for those we we love. But every one of those evaluations, positive and negative, has something in common. And that's this. The unregenerate man or woman looks at Jesus and does not see the magnificent, matchless glory of the only begotten Son of God. The dead heart looks at Jesus, the most glorious person in the universe, and sees no beauty, no divine loveliness. Maybe a little bit of admiration. He's a great teacher. But not the thrilling, compelling, satisfying Savior that He is. Regeneration and regeneration alone changes that. Let's look again at 2 Corinthians 4. Flip a page back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in verse 4. Paul describes the unregenerate person when he says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see, this is the sinner's problem. This is what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins. Not that you're motionless or stagnant, but that you were devoid of spiritual life, the spiritual life that allows you to see the value of the glory of Christ that's revealed in the gospel. The essence of spiritual death is spiritual blindness to the glory of Christ. Our Spiritual perception is so disordered by sin that we look upon what is objectively delightful, namely the glory of Jesus, and we're repulsed by Him. And then we see what is repulsive, namely the glory of sin and of self, and we're enamored with it. We love darkness and we hate the light. We love filth and we despise beauty. But then... God shines the light of life into the blind heart, verse 6. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He gives us new spiritual eyes so that we finally see sin for what it is in all its objective ugliness. And we finally see Christ for who He is in all His objective beauty and glory. And with our eyes finally opened, finally able to see and evaluate things as they actually are, we turn away in repentant disgust from the filth of sin and self, and we cling to our glorious Savior with the embrace of saving faith. Peter 
James and John went up to the Mount of Transfiguration with the Jesus they viewed according to the flesh. But when Christ, as it were, peeled back the veil of His human flesh, and His face shone brighter than the sun, and His garments were whiter than any launderer could whiten them, the disciples knew Him after the flesh no longer. Luke, 30, Luke 9.32 says, They saw His glory. And in the same way, everyone who experiences the miracle of regeneration beholds a transfiguration of Christ with the eyes of their heart. And whatever your fleshly evaluation of Him was, the veil over your heart is lifted, and, the, and you behold Him as glorious, God of very God, fully God, fully man, the only mediator between God and man, the Lamb of God, our substitutionary sacrifice our merciful and faithful high priest who has propitiated the Father's wrath, who ever lives to make intercession for us, the resurrected and victorious one, the conqueror of sin and death, and above all, the supremely lovely one, glorious in holiness, clothed in the beauty and splendor of divine majesty, one who is more satisfying than all that, li of, uh, than all that life can offer and all that death can take. Calvary, I ask you, have you beheld Him as He is? Have you seen this Jesus? Has the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ invaded the dungeon of your depraved heart and opened your eyes to His beauty? Is He your pearl of great price? Is He that treasure hidden in a field? Is He the one for whom you would gladly suffer the loss of all things? If Christ should will it so. Dear sinner, if not, if that is not your heart's testimony, cry to Him. Get on your face and lift your voice to heaven that God might be merciful to you. To reveal to you the beauty and glory of His Son. The very first result of regeneration is being made a new creation in Christ, is that you're given a new view of Christ that embraces Him with a whole soul to trust, saving faith and satisfaction. The second result of regeneration, the third point in our outline this morning, is a new view of others. A new view of others. Look again with me at the first half of verse 16. Paul writes, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Now, this is so important. If we know much about Christian theology at all, we know that regeneration results in a changed view of Christ. What we don't often hear, what we don't often think about and meditate on is that when we are transformed from the inside out in regeneration and our assessment of Jesus changes, so also does our assessment of everyone else in the world. See, in regeneration, our entire person has been renovated. The old things have passed away. New things have come in every aspect of our life. One commentator puts it this way. He says, when a person becomes a Christian, he or she experiences a total restructuring of life that alters its whole fabric, thinking, feeling, willing, and acting. Pastor John MacArthur says, old values, ideas, plans, loves, desires, and beliefs vanish Replaced by the new things that accompany them. plants new desires, loves, inclinations, and truths in the redeemed so that they live in the midst of the old creation with a new creation perspective. This is what I like to call the wrecking ball of regeneration. When you become a new creation in Christ, all your goals, all your hobbies, all your ambitions and joys in life are like a building that has been leveled to the ground by this wrecking ball of regeneration. And in its place is an entirely new creation built, upon the Spirit, built by the Spirit of God upon the foundation of Christ. We're now with new tastes, now with new affections, new joys, and new ambitions. And along with all of that newness comes also new ways of assessing other people. New canons of appraisal, new standards according to which we arrive at our estimation of people. Just as Paul once knew Christ according to the flesh, just as he once esteemed or appraised or evaluated Jesus 
according to the world's preoccupation with outward appearance, so also Paul recognized or regarded or viewed or appraised or valued other people according to the flesh as well. But, he says, from now on, from this point forward, since the time of his regeneration and conversion to Christ, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. The one who is united to Christ and become a new creation in him has put off those fleshly canons of appraisal which judge men only on the basis of superficial external matters. And I'm so jealous for us to understand as a church, as a, a, a church universal, for us to understand the implications of this and to apply them to our lives. Because far too often, Christians have not distinguished ourselves from the unregenerate in their personal standards, in our personal standards of judgment and evaluation of others. We appraise people on the basis of their physical attractiveness. You know, we tend to be more pleasant to and engaging with people that we find physically attractive as opposed to those we don't. We appraise people on the basis of their style of dress. We're impressed with a well-tailored suit or a nice dress, but we're just wondering why the guy in a t-shirt and jeans can't dress up for church once in a while. We judge people on their educational achievement. And somebody says, I have a master's degree in this, so I have a doctorate in that. You say, oh, he's an expert in his field. Wow, okay, Dr. So-and-so. We judge people on the basis of their social status, uh, the house they own, the, the cars they drive, the clothes they wear. We judge people on the basis of their eloquence or their athletic abilities or their level of success in the business world or their political affiliation. And one of the saddest truths concerning the visible church is that so many professing believers still allow their opinions of others and their understanding of their own identity to be shaped by their ethnicity, by the color of their skin. And friends, the Holy Spirit of God but the inspiration of this text of sacred scripture is telling us that none of those things has any place in the mind of one who has been regenerated and united to Christ. None of them. They are not the basis upon which we evaluate others, and they are not the sources from which we derive our own identity. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. In Christ, there is neither slave nor free. And think for a moment about what a radical statement that is from the pen of Saul of Tarsus. This was the most promising young rabbi in Jerusalem, educated under Gamaliel, supervising the persecution and execution of Christians. This is the one circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Israel, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, a persecutor, blameless according to the ceremonial law time was when his, own, his only canon of evaluation was whether or not someone met the strict pharisaical standards of Mosaic ceremonialism. If he did, that man was a brother. If he didn't, he was a dog. And now, there is neither Jew nor Greek. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Regeneration happened. Salvation happened. The new birth happened to him. Listen to Galatians 6.15. The one who boasted in his eighth day circumcision. Galatians 6.15. Paul says, For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision anything. The only thing that matters is a new creation. Circumcised, uncircumcised, doesn't matter. Your ethnicity doesn't matter. Your religious rituals don't matter. What matters is whether or not there has been a new creation. What matters is, is this person that I'm talking to, thinking about evaluating, is this person regenerate or not? Is he united to Christ or not? Is he a child of God or not? Colossians 3, 10 and 11, Paul says, we've laid aside the old self, we've put on the new self, the old is gone, the new has come, and that new self is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. You see, the, the regenerate man has been so dominated by Christ. That's the only point of reference for his view of anyone. Whether or not they're in Christ, the new view of Christ that's born in those who have been made a new creation necessarily issues in a new view of others. 
And this reaches even to the level of family. And I want you to hear me. At the end of Matthew chapter 12, Matthew records an incident where Jesus' mothers and brothers, or mother and brothers, were willing to speak with Je- or waiting to speak with Jesus after he finished teaching the crowds. And so someone lets him know, hey, your mother and your brothers are waiting out there for you. And his response is stunning. Matthew 12, 48. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. You see, Jesus regarded no man or woman after the flesh, not even his own family. What mattered was whether or not they believed in him. So friends, nationalism means nothing. You have a deeper connection to true Christians in Iraq, Iran, Syria, Afghanistan than to any unbeliever here in America. Ethnicity is nothing. You have a more intimate union with genuine believers who are black, white, Asian, Hispanic, whatever, than to any person, unregenerate person, who shares the color of your skin or the the parentage and lineage of your heritage. Even family, in comparison to Christ, is nothing. Jesus says that he has a thicker bond with the children of God than he does even with his own mother. Now, family remains. Ethnicity remains. Gender distinctions remain. But all of those things are absolutely inconsequential in determining one's status before God or his place within God's kingdom. We regard no man after the flesh. We are not, 2 Corinthians 5.12, those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. And where that really intersected for Paul was how the false apostles were persuading the Corinthians to do just that, to regard Paul after the flesh, to look down upon him and, and judge him accursed because of how severely he suffered in the cause of ministry. But Paul says, look, those who are truly united to Christ have been born again. They have been totally renovated. They have been entirely renewed. And as a result, they don't judge men and ministries on the fleshly basis of external appearance, of outward success, of worldly power and prestige. If they did, they'd have to judge Christ and his cross to be a failure. Paul saying, the false apostles are judging me the same way I used to judge Christ, after the flesh. And in so doing, they've, they're giving away. They're they're demonstrating that they have not experienced the transformation of regeneration that makes all those who are united to Christ, that marks all those who are united to Christ in saving faith. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, that you and I make the same error as the false apostles in Corinth anytime we look at a man or woman and allow their appearance, their dress, their financial portfolio, their resume, or their skin color, to determine our estimation of them rather than the state of their heart before God. The man or woman in Christ is a new creation, one who has been totally transformed from the inside out, starting with his view of Christ and reaching even to his view of everyone else. This is what it means to be regenerate. This is what it means to be born again. This is what it means to be a Christian. And so, friends, the the question you need to ask yourselves this morning as you hear these descriptions of the true Christian is, am I creation? Have I experienced this radical disruption of everything in my life? Has the Holy Spirit leveled to the ground everything that I sought my identity in? Has he given me new eyes to see the glory of Christ? Has he given me ears to hear the wisdom of divine truth? Has he removed my heart of stone and given me new desires and loves and inclinations and ambition? Has he given me a heart of flesh that hates sin and loves righteousness? Is Christ precious to me? Or can I take him or leave him? Is sin repulsive to me? Or am I under its thumb? Have I renounced evaluating others on the basis of fleshly externals? Have I renounced seeking my own identity in those things as well? Am I a new creation? And if not, dear friend, don't try to convince yourself 
that there is spiritual life where there is only death. Don't try to fabricate this new creation by trying to clean up your life. You can't engineer the radical supernatural change that must take place in your heart. You can't raise yourself from the dead. But come to Christ in repentance and faith. Only He can accomplish what you need. Only He can make you alive. The final verse of our chapter, 2 Corinthians 5.21, declares the Father made the Son, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And so as His ambassadors, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you, be reconciled to God through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And dear brothers and sisters, if you are a new creation, if you have been reconciled, if you have become the righteousness of God in Him, if by God's great grace you have experienced this glorious gift of regeneration, then friends, live like it. Live like a new creation in 2019. Think about the salvation that you have been granted. I want to read just briefly from the Heidelberg Catechism, question 60. Listen to this. Although my conscience accused me, this is the cry of every one of you who knows Christ, every one of you has been regenerated. Although my conscience accuse me that I have grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and have never kept any of them and am still prone always to all evil, the merit of mine, of mere grace, grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction of the holiness of Christ as if I'd never committed nor had any sin and had myself accomplished all the obedience which Christ has fulfilled for me, if only I accept such a benefit with a believing heart. That is amazing. And that is ours. That is ours to confess because of nothing that we've done. And so I ask you, is that saving God not worth a life of faithfulness? Is He not worth a life of diligent pursuit of Him in Bible reading every morning? And maybe every evening in 2019, is he not worth the disciplined pursuit of himself in prayer, in communion with him? Is he not worth faithfulness demonstrated in a vital investment in your local church? Being here, but not just being here. Investing and participating and sharpening one another. And confronting sin in one another and forgiving one another and, and confessing to one another. Bible study, fellowship time. Is, is Christ not worth? Is this regeneration, this new creation, does that not issue in the, the diligent mortification of sin? The, the, the one who has no peace with sin until it walks over the bellies of, a, of his own lusts, John Owen said. Are you going to use 2019 to get a stranglehold over your, your lustful corruptions, to mortify sin in your life? You've been created again to do just that. And evangelism. Is Christ not worth, is this gospel not worthy of proclamation? More than proclamation of begging and pleading and imploring people, like Paul does in verse 20, to be reconciled to Jesus. Dear friend, you're a new creation. Go out and tell others of this glorious gospel that they might become new creations. As we close 2018 and look ahead to 2019, to a year that God will give us of mercy, may we live as new creations in Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, would you accomplish that very thing in your people? Would you open eyes to see the loveliness of Jesus? Would you grant the miracle of regeneration even today, even this moment? And for those whose eyes you've opened, would you open them afresh? Would you freshly overwhelm us with the, and ravish us with the beauty of Jesus so that all the fuel for all our obedience and all of our discipline is, is fired by that glory so that none of this is drudgery, none of this is burdensome, but it's a delight and a joy to follow Christ in discipleship. You can accomplish this by the power of your Spirit, and we ask you to do it. In Christ's name, amen.